So we were studying together uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, that's what we were covering together. And uh, sorry, we were, we finished the section 1 and we were going into the second section and then the third section of uh, Ephesians chapter 3. And uh, this second section is uh, pressing toward the goal. So yes, in this Christian journey, we have a heavenly goal that we need to achieve as individuals, as a church together. But also we have uh, personal goals in our life. And Paul is going to encourage each one of us to be pursuing uh, the divine, the heavenly goals that are set for all of us and also our personal goals. Now, Paul, Paul says to us, uh, not that I have already attained or have arrived uh, or I am already perfected or even mature, but I press on, hallelujah, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ uh, has also laid hold of me. So that's what uh, Brother Paul is telling us. None of us uh, is there yet. The, the Christian journey is to be able to say to yourself, no matter how many years you have been in Christianity, always continue to be teachable. Yes, always continue to be teachable. That's why we continue to read our Bible year in, year out. We don't say that uh, because I will read my Bible 50 times and that's it. No, when you are going to read it the 51th time, you are going to discover a brand new light, a brand new layer. Uh, we were discussing with my mom uh, during our family prayer. <laughs> she see what she was saying to my dad was during the family prayer. So your, your, your dad has read the Bible cover to cover at least three times, but he doesn't have the understanding that you have. When you, the way you do that, you just connect the scriptures, the one that is coming to the left, the one that is coming right, you take from the Old Testament, you take from the New Testament, uh, and we were just laughing. Uh, it does not matter. It is don't have it as a badge. I read the Bible five times, ten times, and then you go everywhere. I read the Bible ten times, cover to cover. <laughs> well, you were supposed to read it cover to cover. But our attitude should always be an attitude of humility. And part of humility is to be able to say, I don't know everything yet. God still has something to tell me and to teach me. Even babes have something to teach me. The moment you become proudful, God stops speaking to you. The moment you become arrogant, God dissociates, uh, knows you now from afar. Moses was the meekest person on the face of the earth. And God has something for the meek. He actually is a fond of those who are meek. So if you are humble, uh, full of meekness, power under control, then you are a good candidate for the revelations of God. He's going to be able to tell you many, many secrets. So don't ever be satisfied with... Uh, your current affairs with uh, what you have achieved today and there are always more hallelujah i've not attained yet uh, until you are able to see what uh, the others were able to do in the bible then don't stop and once you have attained or you've been able to accomplish what they accomplished don't stop the belief for greater things. That's what Jesus said. First of all, start by doing works that I do. Until you've not done what I do, don't stop. And then once you've done what I've done, then start doing more than what I've done, greater works than these. So we, the, we only arrive when we are called home. As long as there is still breath in us, we continue to press on. This is our attitude as Christians. And uh, we never believe for one minute that we have the monopoly of the Holy Spirit. The moment you will think that God only can speak through us and he has nothing to say to us or through other people, then we are in trouble. We are in danger. Even out of the, uh, an ass, 
the donkey. God spoke to the madness of the prophet. Even through nature, God speaks like uh, Solomon in the book of Proverbs. Said, Go even learn from the ant. Look at the leech, the leech and uh, all the other insects, the lion. Learn from even nature. God can speak to you. And uh, always be teachable. You've not arrived. Even if you learned all the Greeks and you have a doctorate in divinity in uh, Greek and in Hebrew, well, Paul was speaking perfectly Greek and Hebrew. So the fact that you know the Hebrew and the Greek doesn't make you a mature Christian. The Hebrews were speaking Hebrew, Paul called them, they were babed. So you will never attain, but you need to continue. The attitude should be how I'm going to perfect myself. I'm going to be a better version of me next year i will be looking more and more like christ god is going to chip away think of yourself as i've explained in the perfect redemption plan for jehovah shama as uh, you are a big rock and god is a, a craftsman a sculptor and uh, he's chipping away with a sizzle the excess uh, rock so that he can make um a masterpiece out of you so that the image of Christ that is hidden inside you, that rock, may be formed also in the outside. So, and then you take some uh, sandpaper. Once he has used the big hammers, he's going to use small hammers. And then uh, uh, he's going to use uh, some uh, sandpaper with different uh, uh, granularity and be sending the the sculpture until it is so smooth and all the character the traits of christ that was hidden in you is now seen and visible by everyone outside the rough ages are now very smooth in your life so until we get there we don't consider ourselves uh, as people that have already attained so also we need to stop comparing ourselves with uh, others because i may feel like I'm doing better than my brother as far as holiness is concerned but I'm not comparing myself with them I'm comparing myself with the standard and what is the standard Christ Jesus Matthew chapter 5 Jesus said be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect so I read how my father is supposed to behave towards us and I also behave likewise towards my fellow uh humans and also jesus came to give us an example john chapter 13 he said i've come to give you an ensemble the king james says an ensemble meaning it is like a prototype a sample of blood like when they take a sample of blood they put it in a flask and bring it to the laboratory to exam to analyze the blood the small 100 milliliter or whatever 50 milliliter that they took uh, from your blood and they analyze it is uh, supposed to be a representation of the composition of what is going on uh, as far as uh, white cells or red cells and all the immune system or bacteria and viruses uh, is going to be represented uh, in that um, sample of blood so that's what God wants us to be, to be like a sample, a prototype. He, he came and showed us what a prototype is. And all the other cars that are going to be mass produced are going to be just like the original prototype. So this is what we want to have in our mind. We're not comparing ourselves with others. Otherwise, I'm going to think I've arrived already. But as I look into the perfect law of liberty, I can continue to press on because I know I've not arrived yet. When I'm standing beside Christ Jesus, when I have a revelation of myself, then I realize that sometimes I'm a proudful person and God says to me to deal with the proud, with the pride. And uh, sometimes I'm being resentful, hallelujah, and I need to deal with resentment. Now, resentment is to, to, to feel bitter because you were uh, done some, some injustice. Hallelujah. And as I was reading my Bible two weeks ago, and uh, the Lord, I was reading the Amplified Classic, and I was reading Matthew, and the Lord started to talk to me about uh, resentment because 
in the King, New King James Version, the word resentment is not in that verse. But as I read it in that verse, the Lord said resentment. And when I looked it up, I realized that uh, while it is, you, you, it, is, it is a natural thing to, to be resentful because you are feeling bitter because of uh, the way you were treated unjustly. But God even says even the root of uh, bitterness or the resentment, you should uh, get it away from your heart. I know you were unjustly treated, but I want you even to pray for those who were who despitefully used you. So immediately I say, oh, I'm not having this in my heart anymore. And then I picked up the phone and I called the person that did me injustice. And we talked about everything. And then I hung up. I said, Satan, you're a liar. I'm going to continue to press on. Regardless of how they behave, that's not my problem. But me, I'm going to behave as God wants me to behave. Be perfect as Jesus wants me to be perfect. So we keep on pressing on. And uh, our dealings with God are no longer going to be stop adultery, stop fornication, stop stealing money, stop uh, cursing. Those kind of stuff, stop having a silly mouth, mouth. No, God is now going to deal with the heart. You see, the Pharisees, they always, they were good because they washed the outside of the cup. So the outside of the cup was clean. That was not the problem. They were not into fornication. They were not into adultery. They were not into blatant sin, okay? They were given the tithe, even uh, of mint and the rue and uh, all the herbs. They were never defaulting in the tithe. So they were clean on the outside. What the problem that God had with them was the inside. In the inside, they had all kinds of filthy things, uh, things that were decaying, decomposing. God wanted to clean the inside, not just uh, the outside. And that's what Christianity is all about. And once you get uh, a real personal relationship with God, then it starts dealing with the inside, what is inside you. So that... Uh, from the abundance of the heart, your mouth will speak. So that when you are going to speak, even your own heart believes uh, what you are saying. And people know that when you are speaking, you're always coming, uh, you're always coming from a place of love. God is going to work on you to develop compassion because you can't have a healing if uh, you don't have compassion. God, Jesus was always moved with the compassion. If you don't see those people who are sick as your own mother, as your own brother, as your own son, as your own sister, you will never, never pray for them, intercede for them, fast for them. As is part of compassion, it is not just uh, mere words. You put your money where your mouth is, in, <laughs> as a uh, uh, proverb you're saying. Meaning you back up your words with uh, concrete uh, actions. What would what did Jesus have to gain by coming and dying on the cross? He had nothing to gain. He had everything to lose. He came and uh, because his soul loved us. And when you can pray and fast for other people, then you have nothing to gain. They can't give you any money. They can't give you uh, any reward at all. And in fact, even sometimes they are going to leave you after you pray for them and so on and so forth. So you're not doing that, doing that because of any reward per se. You're doing that because you love them. Because if it were your mother, your father who was going through that kind of thing, then uh, you will do anything, anything. So you are going to continue to press on until your heart becomes like the heart of Christ. Even if they don't receive you, you are still going to even lay your, your, your life, life down, jeopardize your life for them so that they can be saved, they can be healed, they can be delivered. If we considered John chapter first, first John chapter first John chapter three verse sixteen, if we consider that one person Christ laid down his life for all of us, so we also ought to lay down our life for one another. God is going to move you from uh, feel your love, family love. You only do things if people are re re your blood relatives. That's so easy. That comes naturally to 
at least a filly or a friend still sticks closer than a brother. And then from filly is going to move you to agape love. So we keep on going from glory to glory to our degree of love. You are going to know the depth, the width, the length, and the height of the love of God that cannot be found in Christ Jesus. Your heart is going to become very soft. Uh, like I told you on Sunday, I sometimes use him to bleed physically and I'm not going to cry at all. But these days, uh, sometimes I cry for, I don't know, because people are sick. I cry because I see the people going to hell. And uh, there is an urgency in my heart. There is a, uh, it is not because of, uh, they, are, they are related to me for, biologically no because God loves them and God cares for them and God now can come and pour out his uh, heart and discuss with me and he can also discuss with you keep on pressing hallelujah in your personal life as well this is not your rest for your family this is not your rest whatever you think that you have achieved this is not your rest the church stop growing when people feel Con we need to be content but content with the stage where we are not envying anybody but at the same time we are doing everything that is uh, our responsibility to move on to the next uh, step because uh, there is a place where every one of us uh, at the top if only we are willing to pay the price so when we went Peter and Paul are telling us to be content. It doesn't mean that uh, we don't have any ambition. No. He's telling us where you are, you don't have to envy anybody. You can celebrate every stage of life. Many of us don't know how to celebrate uh, uh, life. We wait until I get that uh, degree, until I get that uh, husband. That's when I'm, I'm going to rejoice. No, rejoice every day. Again, I say rejoice. Celebrate every step, every daily victory. And uh, when now uh, the final goal that you had is achieved, then you are going to, to celebrate also. But if you don't learn to celebrate and uh, to thank God for every stage, for every step that you are taking, and you're always going to be frustrated and comparing yourself with others, don't compare yourself with others. So being content doesn't mean that you don't have any vision. You are celebrating where you are and you are having nobody knowing that if you do what uh, they have done, you are going to move next, uh, next, uh, the next stage. The seed that was planted five years ago of olive tree, of course it is bearing olives this year. But the seed that is planted today doesn't have to envy this the, the, a five-year-old olive tree if it, it is watered properly, it uh, is um, donged perfectly or fertilized perfectly, then uh, in five, in four years' time, it's going to be also be bearing the same kind of fruits. There's no need. So it's content with its growth today and tomorrow, knowing that in four years' time, it's going to be also just exactly where the other three, uh, three is. So being content doesn't mean that you don't have any vision or any ambition. You are just celebrating what you are and you are doing everything that you, is your responsibility to move on to the next uh, stage in the name of Jesus. Christ already is there waiting for you. He has laid hold of you for that very reason. So don't let go of the hand of Jesus. Focus on him, the author and the finisher of your faith and continue to move on in the right direction now we move on to verse 13 now verse 13 paul says brethren i do not count myself to have actually uh, arrived hallelujah yes now uh i do not count myself to have apprehended or arrived hallelujah you should never think that you've arrived whatever you are I don't think that you have arrived. God will unfold a new vision. Hallelujah. Season one, season two, season three, season four, it keeps on unfolding and many more things are going to come. Uh, yesterday, Tanzania, today, India, and uh, tomorrow, a healing crusade with uh, stadiums here in the UK. 
we've not arrived yet. But one thing I do, what, what is that? Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things uh, which are ahead. So this you need to learn to do. Many times uh, our greatest enemies are actually our past victories. Hallelujah. Many times our greatest, vict uh, en our greatest enemies are our past victories because we settle. We think I've arrived. What else can I do? I have arrived. Now I have a bachelor degree. Now I have a master degree. Now I have a child. I have arrived. And then we completely become visionless. You've not arrived. Don't consider, don't, don't count yourself to have already apprehended or arrived. No. One thing that you need to do in this Christian journey, you need to learn to forget the things that are behind. And uh, your gazes should be ahead and uh, reaching forward, not backward, reaching forward the thing, to those things which are ahead. Hallelujah. And this is not just in the negative, because one, sometimes we read this one, we think it is only God is telling us just to forget the, the negative things that happened to us, uh, how I was abused, how I was uh, uh, lied, um, uh, people lied about me. We only think about God asking us to forget uh, how I had a divorce, how that man left me with my child. Yes, those things also you need to forget about them. Isaiah 43 verse 10 also tells us exactly uh yes uh as i 43 i think is verse uh, 19 uh 18 and 19 for god says do not remember the former things or uh, nor consider the things of old behold i'm doing a new thing now it shall spring forth shall you not know it uh, I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So Paul basically is uh, basing uh, this verse uh, 13 on uh, Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19. Now, this can apply to the negative aspect, how you are abused, how men let you down, how pastors abused you, and I will never trust again. So be careful to not make... Uh, uh, a vow against yourself. Many people, they make a vow against themselves and stand in, in the spiritual realm because they say, look, I will never trust anybody. After I've been abused like that, I will never trust any man. After I've been abused by pastors like that, I will never trust any man of God. And uh, that's a vow against themselves. God says, forget also the wounds that you had in the past, but also the past victories. Because when you had a leader like Moses, and he performed all those signs, those wonders, those miracles, what else is left to, to perform as signs and wonders? Who can ever fulfill or uh, step into the shoes of Moses to take over from him as a leader? Of Israel? It is impossible. God say, forget all those. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to do new things with you, Joshua. First, I'm going to do what uh, I did with uh, Moses. You are going to part also the, the Jordan, just like he parted the Red Sea. So I'm going to give even more victories. Moses defeated three kings, uh, Pharaoh and the uh, king of Og and of uh, Basham. Okay, two, that's the three kings. But uh, Joshua defeated uh, 31 kings. He did greater things. He stopped the, the, the sun and the moon. He did, God did new things with him. God did a double with Elijah, Elisha what, uh, than what he did with Elijah. Elijah had eight recorded miracles, and Elisha had 16 recorded miracles. I'm doing a new thing. So you stop being intimidated by what uh, they did. You are going to be able to do the same thing and even greater things. That's why when Yongichu had the biggest church, Adeboye went and saw it, he came back and God did a new thing with Adeboe. He did what uh, Yongisho did, and he outdid. You know, he has outdone what uh, Yongisho did. And many 
Because faith comes by hearing, yes, but it also comes by seeing. That's why when Elizabeth or when Mary was pregnant, God sent her, go and see your cousin, uh, Elizabeth, that is already six months ahead of you in a pregnancy. When you see a miracle happening to, you know, that God has done already, and there's a proof, you also, your faith is uh, boosted to believe for the same thing and even greater things. That's why God wants you to be associated with the right kind of people, people that have the right mindset. You cannot have a big vision like an eagle and be flocking with the chickens. It won't work. They're going to kill your vision because they don't see the, the use of you soaring. Uh, they're not just stay there at, on the ground, be eating worms. You need some time to dissociate yourself from what you thought was your best. My career was the best because I have the. You, do you think that your career was the best? I have something better than, than that. So have a vision of the Lord. What is God showing you? Where are we going as a church? We are going to a place where we are going to plant uh, tens of thousands of churches across Europe in the 50 European nations. We are going to a place where we are going to be holding healing crusade here with uh, places that can contain 100,000 people because that's what God said. We are going to a place where there will be 300,000 families saved. But do you think that God is going to stop with 300,000? No, he's going to do more than that. But that's the only thing that I could believe. So he gave me a small number, 300,000. Not until we've not seen it manifest or manifested, we continue to press on. We are looking for, we are not looking backward. Someone called me, oh, can you come to our church? <laughs> we are going to give you a salary. Become a Baptist minister or in, in, in how do you call it? Newton Milton Keynes. The child salary is uh, twenty four thousand, and uh, the, you have a house uh, in the parsonage, and you have a car given. I said to you, <laughs> I'm looking forward. You said, do you have a salary in the house? I said, I don't have any salary, but I'm pressing on. I know that I'm going to get more than that. Many of you are compromising your destiny because you settle for less. Like Gaza, he settled for the little gold of uh, Naaman and he forfeited a great destiny. What is the vision that you have? You settle for 24,000? So what are you saying? What do you see, Jeremiah? If you see well, I'm going to perform my words. Jeremiah chapter 32 Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12, sorry. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12. If you see correctly, then I'm going to perform my word. If you have the wrong vision, if your eye is a single, Jesus says, it's all good, like the New King James says, but if your eye is single, you don't have uh, uh, dyslexia, but your eye, or crossed eyes, your eye is a single, then your whole body is going to be full of light. You're going to have a light all around you to see exactly where you are going. So keep pressing on in the name of Jesus. Uh, looking forward, forgetting the things that are behind. Don't remember them anymore. Your best is yet to come in your relationship with your children. Your best is yet to come. It is ahead of you. And so shall it be. Now it goes on to verse 14. He says, I press towards the goal for the prize of which uh, of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Keep on pressing. There is a goal. Your calling was not in vain. God has a goal. Why he called you? So find out why God called you. As for me, I know. The House of Prayer for All Nations, we've come here to win the 50 European nations and also to destroy the dominance of uh, the Vatican over the Latin countries in Europe because it has a grip over those nations. But it is a spiritual warfare. So God has a goal for sending us here in Scotland to stand in the gap on behalf of the land. So that's the goal that he wants to save millions of souls, plunder, like Banke used to say, plunder hell and populate heaven. 
so press towards that goal for which uh, for for the prize of uh, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, therefore, because of that, because I have a goal in my life, every therefore, let us as many as are mature. So it takes some maturity. Hallelujah. Some spiritual growth. Have this kind of mind. Hallelujah. And if in anything you think otherwise, <laughs> I don't need to argue with you. God himself will reveal this to you. And let God reveal these things to you. Because sometimes we try so hard to convince the people. Because they don't see what we are saying. But I pray that you are going to be able to catch the vision. And why you need to sanctify yourself. I need to sanctify myself. Because God has a great work for us. You see, the people that don't have a vision, they cast off restraints. It's only when you have a vision that you discipline yourself. So without a vision, the people cast off restraints. When you don't have a goal, a purpose in life, when you don't know it, though God has one for you, you cast off restraint, you live, you, you live care, carelessly. But when you have a vision, you have uh, discovered your purpose here on earth, your goal, uh, the upper, upward call that God has for you in Christ, uh, then your life becomes a uh, uh, disciplined, a uh, disciplined life. You put some things in place so that you are going to make sure that what you saw in your vision will come to pass because you know that this version of you or this version of me is not what is needed on where God is sending me to speak to kings, to speak to uh royalties and uh, nobles to speak to everybody to speak to millions of people not this version of me no i need to become more knowledgeable i need to mature so there are some things that of jesus it is written unto us let us read it isaiah uh, isaiah had so many prophecies uh, isaiah chapter 9 i think isaiah says is it uh, chapter 9 or chapter 7? Uh, unto us. The son uh, is born. Aha, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Yes, he says, for unto us a child is born. Yes, a child is born. And unto us a son is given. And the government uh, will be uh, upon his uh, shoulders. And... Uh, his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You see, unto us a child was born. Christ was born in a manger, that's fine. But it is not on a child that Jesus bestowed, God bestowed the kingdom. It is on a mature son that he bestowed the kingdom. Not on the boy. Not on him. He waited until he was 30 years of age. Because that's some responsibility that you can only have after you've matured spiritually. So it is uh, to a full grown up that those responsibilities of going to the cross were given. A baby did not die on the cross, an adolescent did not die on the cross. A fully grown up son died on the cross. Some maturity is needed. Some uh, paradigm shift is needed so that you have a brand new, the mind of Christ. Let this mind that was in Christ be also in you so that you can embrace not just the power of his resurrection because only babies want the power of the resurrection without uh, the, the fellowship of his suffering. That's why also many marriages are, are divorcing because they only want for better. They don't want for worse. They, they only want for riches, but they don't want for poverty. They are not willing to work hard at building that relationship and going through the storms of life and coming out on the other side victorious together. They tell you, sort your own business first, well, and then I will come. But if you don't suffer with me, why will I take you to reign with me? The same thing with God. Those who are mature, they learn to suffer with people. They learn to endure hardship with God and with the people around them. That's what makes you very tight. There is such a camaraderie in the military, especially in the Navy SEAL 
or the Marine Corps, because you suffer together. You go through the training together, the boot camp together, you suffer together. And that's why even when you are no longer part, though you're no longer part of the Marines, but once a Marine, always a Marine. You can't help it. The spirit of the core is in you. Because through the suffering, you became one. And if you don't suffer with Christ, if you only want uh, to reign with him, you will never reign also with him because he cannot trust you. He cannot trust me if I, I'm not able to suffer with him either. So you start maturing. And that's when responsibilities are put on your shoulders. And the government or an influence over nations are, are given unto Luke chapter 22. Jesus said to his disciples, just like my father bestowed the kingdom upon my shoulders, I also now bestow a kingdom upon your shoulders. So others are not going to think that way. They say, no, I don't believe in that part of the suffering. I don't believe in that part of the hardship in the gospel, at the part of the persecution. I don't believe in that. Paul doesn't want to argue. They are just spiritually babes. He says God is, God, God is going to teach them uh, <laughs> and reveal those things to them in the name of Jesus. If they just want to reign without suffering with Christ, without going through the persecution and so on and so forth, they will never experience it. So, But I don't need to argue. God himself will reveal that to them. And so shall it be. Now, now verse 16, he says, Nevertheless, now, to the degree, we see there are degrees in our Christian uh, experience, to the degree that we have already attained. So you see, we are going from glory to glory, from grace to grace, and tomorrow we are going to be better Christians, better committed Christians, but you need to start somewhere. So nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, now let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. So the way Brother Jerry is behaving should be the way you are behaving because Brother Jerry is trying to imitate Christ. And tomorrow there's going to be a better version of Brother Jerry. And you also are going to be a better version of you. Imitate me as I am imitating Christ. So let us all walk together we are by the same rule. The rule of love. The rule of holiness. The rule of... Uh, Truth. Because Christianity is all about uh, the way, the truth, and the life. And Christianity used to be called uh, the way. They understood that they need to embrace uh, the way, the truth, and the life of Christ. If they were to be called the disciples of Jesus. And uh, they should love one another, the work of love. So, to the degree that we have already attained... Let us uh, decide to walk uh, with the same, by, by the same rule. Uh, let us uh, be of the same mind. That we are bearing one another's burden. We are praying for one another. If you can be discouraged. Now, Brother Jerry also can be discouraged. So if Brother Jerry is praying for you, so you also remember to pray and intercede for Brother Jerry because he's a human like you. Even Jesus, when he was going through uh, Calvary, I in Gethsemane, that Oliver Press, that's what about Gethsemane means in Luke chapter 22. He called his disciples, Can you at least pray with me? He was looking for someone to pray with me. He was in agony and he was uh, sweating blood. And uh, that was uh, people sweating blood was recorded in uh, the, during the First World War. Some of the British the soldiers that were in the trenches before they launched the attack against the, the Nazi, they were so terrified, fearful in dread that they were, the perspiration was blood. The cells just broke in the skin and they were just sweating blood. So that's an agony like uh, Luke, Dr. Luke described it. He was bleeding, uh, he, he was sweating blood. And he wanted his others to pray for him. Peter, he took a, his closest friend, Peter, John, and uh, James. Can you come and tarry with me in prayer? I'm wrestling with that idea of going to the cross. If there's another way, maybe for me to save mankind, let me do that. But Father said, no, there's no other way. 
So we need to get that maturity. Well, we, we, part of intercession is, is all about that. We no longer think about ourselves. We think about others. We pray for those who are in authority because they face uh, many more persecution. So we pray for them to continue to stand uh, as a role model spiritually, physically, so that we can uh, imitate them. Lots of people are afraid to say imitate me as I imitate Christ because uh, they've just given up on being a role model. Actually, Christians is about being role models. You being able to tell other your children, your church people, imitate me as I'm imitating the Christ. I'm going to do my best, my uttermost. I'm going to go from glory to glory. I've not arrived yet. I've had a work in progress, but I'm not making any excuse either. And you're encouraging many other people. And so shall it be in Jesus' name. There are many things that God I want to tell you, but uh, is waiting for us to have some maturity for us to be able to understand how to receive it. Like you say to his disciples, I have many things to tell you, but you are not able to receive it. But when I'm gone, the Holy Spirit is going to come and remind you of those things that you are not willing to embrace in the beginning. So let us walk you the say, uh, by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind towards one another loving towards one another, gentle, kind. And let it be what people know about the house of prayer for all nations, that we love one another. Now, the last section that we are going to cover today is uh, our citizenship. Our citizenship. Now, Paul tells us that our citizenship is in heaven. So that's from verse 17 to 21 to the end. So, Paul says, brethren, brother or sister, join in following my example. You see, we use our life as an example. When we give testimonies, we give our own life as a testimony. As much as possible, use your own life as an example, which also will cause you. You see, two things are going to happen. If we truly do Bible, two things are going to happen. The Holy Spirit is going to convict you that you are a hypocrite. I am a hypocrite. I am a stage performer. And then I'm going to look at the Bible again. I'm not going to read it to preach to anyone first. Or I'm going to read it first and foremost to examine my life. It's going to be a, um, a examination of my own life if I am imitating Christ. And I'm going to make a personal commitment. Or whatever I see here, I'm going to do it. So join in following my example. Imitate me. I'm still pressing on. I've not arrived, but uh, I'm telling you, imitate me. And uh, know to those who walk so, as you have uh, us as a partner. So we are partners in the house of prayer for all nations. Those in leadership are partners. We are examples of how to walk. You see, we need to raise the standard again. Very, very high. Do I have time to explain something? Oh, God have mercy on me. We need to raise the standard very high. And because of that, others also are going to be able to raise uh, the standard. So when we are going to correct things and God is going to be pleased with us and send us uh, many people, and because in the multitude of people, there is uh, the king's honor. And people now, you, have, you are now a force to reckon with then others will be able to change. It is because of some of the reforms among the, the Protestants when we discovered that the Jews shall live by faith with Martin Luther in uh, 1500 that the Catholic Church also had to change just to stop doing the indulgences. So by uh, discovering the, the truth and going, that's what we call the reformation, by going back to the original plan of God, even uh, those that stayed behind in the older church, the Catholic, 
They had to change their ways. They had to change their ways. During the, the Azusa revival, when we went back into holiness movement, and uh, even the Baptist church and the Catholic church also had to change their ways and embrace holiness, and even the Catholic Church now had to be holding a revival meeting and doing a water baptism again. The Baptists were now doing again water baptism again. You are going to push your brothers to um, envy that they would want to compete with you. In now, instead of competing with you for sin, they are going to compete with you for holiness. Now, I remember when I came to Glasgow and I was not taking any money for healing the crusade. Some of the pastors called me. But the Jerry, I did not understand why. They say, you need to take tithe and offering during your crusade. I said, God did not tell me to do that. He said, you need to take it. I did not understand why they were. He said, I'm the one that is losing money. What is your problem? I'm paying for the venue. I'm paying for everything. What is your problem? Why are you so interested in me collecting money? During the healing crusade, say, people giving the church for the they give a time and offering in the church, but for the healing crusade purposefully, we don't collect uh, it. They were so angry, and I did not understand why because they used to bring uh, one minister from uh, South Africa that was coming to do a service here once a year conference, and then he was charging sometimes you need to sow a seed of five thousand uh, pounds, a thousand pounds, two thousand pounds, and you need even to pledge. So when now people started to hear that uh, there are other healing meetings that are taking place in Glasgow and people are not being charged any penny at all. And it is not just because the, the guy was recycling the same testimony of breast cancer. Every year he was coming for five years, the same testimony of breast cancer. People were tired of that same testimony. Is God not doing any other thing than just one testimony? People were being uh, healed, the deaf were hearing and so on and so forth. So he came again. And this time, Nobody was giving him money. Give 5,000, nobody gave. 1,000, nobody gave. 500, nobody gave. Only if you stood up to pledge your 100 pounds. So say, what is happening? They said, there's a one, there's a guy in town. He has spoiled the business for everybody. He has spoiled the business for everybody. Now people go get healed for free. He has spoiled the business. He doesn't take money for the healing. So that's why I run him out. I did, not, I, I did not mean to run him out of Glasgow, but I run him out of town. That was the last time that he ever came from here because there's no more money to collect uh, in Glasgow. He has gone elsewhere to, to use gullible people and the desperation of people. So you see, you are, and I remember another pastor came and said to me, Brother Jerry, you're not the only one who preach about the holiness. I said, what is my, my problem? I'm just busy about my business and preaching. That was in 2015. And because the, the members were complaining, so why do you tell us to leave anyhow? The truth is many women want to be married. The men don't want to be married. They are having free sex, so why should they marry? And the pastors, because they want to keep people in the church, they're more concerned about people sitting in the church than eternal destiny. So they never address that problem, be it in the white churches, in the Indian church, in the black churches. They never address that problem. So the members started to, to tell them, why don't you tell us the truth? There's the one that is telling us holiness that these things in the Bible are not so we are supposed to get married. Why don't you tell us? So the pastor came and said, uh, Brother Jerry, we also preach holiness. It's just the people that don't want to hear holiness. I said, I don't know even your church members. I'm doing what God has told me to do. And then they started to change their message to preach again against the uh, sin. When you set the standard, whether you like it or not, people are going to copy you out of envy and jealousy. But Paul says in that Ephesians chapter 1, let them do so. Because by doing so, at least they are, though they are doing that to compete you, to compete with you, but at least they are preaching the gospel now. And people are going to change. Gradually, they are going to change. I want to do a water baptism somewhere. And then I preached I said to them, when you're going to enter in that water, you need to stop fornication immediately. Have you understood it? Because that's what they did in the Council of Jerusalem. The two things that you need to stop immediately, Act chapter 15, you need to stop all sexual immoralities and you need to stop uh, uh, idolatry. And the rest, 
We are going to fix it. As you stay in church, we are going to teach you. But these two, you need to stop them immediately. Otherwise, you are not born again. And then I said to her, yeah, there were many people that came there for that word baptism. And I said to them after that, okay, there is no such a video. Many of them were pagans. I don't care. I'm there to tell the truth. And then I said to them, I said to one of the guys that was being water baptized, do you have a girlfriend? She said, yes. I said, you need to marry him because there is no such a thing as a fornicator in the Bible. He said, okay, well, I'm going to marry my girlfriend. Yes. And then all the women applauded. And the one of them that was shocking with her boyfriend, she looked at the boyfriend, you need to marry me. Yes. Nobody can, he's able to tell them the truth. Women want to be married, but men are having free sex. So why should they bother to marry you? Someone need to stand, and the Bible always stood for protection of women. So they are not going to be feel used. And then when he's tired, discard that woman. No, no, that's not the will of God. And when I preach, I look at people in the eyes. And many women meet in five, they got married. 14 years they were in that Pentecostal church in five. Nobody told them that no fornicators is going to enter heaven. But as soon as she heard in the healing crusade, Sister Mitchell, she came in 2016, the healing crusade, and I told her the truth. She went back, and within a month, they got married, full stop. We need to be able to say the truth in love. And we live our life as an example, because... Uh, our citizenship is not in heaven. We don't live like the people of this earth. We have a kingdom. We are an ambassador. There's a difference between an immigrant and an ambassador. You are here in the UK. You are an immigrant. If you're from Kenya, you are an immigrant ever from Kenya to the UK. If you're from Congo, from uh, Zimbabwe, from uh, whatever you come from, you are an immigrant from your country to this place. But in the same United Kingdom, there is an ambassador of Zimbabwe. There is an ambassador of uh, Kenya. There is an ambassador of uh, Congo. There is an ambassador of Nigeria. You are here representing your own interest. Self-centeredness. It is for your own interest. But the ambassador of Kenya in the UK is there to represent the interest of uh, the Republic of uh, Kenya. And if you see yourself as an ambassador here on earth, that your citizenship is in heaven, your life here is to represent the values uh, of your kingdom, what your kingdom stands for. And in our kingdom, no fornicator, no idolater, no adulterer, no murderer will ever enter the kingdom of God. I was talking with a wonderful pastor. And then he was involved into a pyramid scheme. A well-crafted modern-day pyramid scheme where allegedly you are investing your money. And I said to him, this is a Ponzi scheme. He said, I know. And I said, do you know that it's going to crash? He said, yes, it's going to crash. But the Lord said to me, it's not going to crash until I've withdrawn all my money. So I said, oh, so you know how pyramid scheme will work? Said, yes. So the, the new money is used to pay the old investors. So they are taking money from the new suckers and giving it to the old suckers and until the pyramid is full and then the whole thing collapses. So you know at the end of the day, someone is going to lose his money. The last people that are going to enter that pyramid scheme, they are going to lose the money. So why on earth you as a minister of the gospel will participate in such a thing? When you, if, if you are ignorant of that kind of business, you know exactly what kind of business it is. It is because it is not your mother. If it were, for instance, you were doing a tantine uh, together, 10 people, and you were all family members, like Rosemary, Lydia, uh, Nyangu, and all the other ones, you put all the money together. Let's say you were 10 of you, you put all the money together. And then the first month, Rosemary eats the money. Hallelujah. A hundred pounds, eats that's a thousand pounds. Rosemary eats the money. And uh, the second month, Lydia eats the money. Hallelujah. Now, when it comes to the turn of Nyangu and the, the other one, Rosemary decides to run away. So Nyangu feels cheated. Now, 
if it is your own biological brother, you are going to be very angry if other people did it to him. And you are going to hate those friends that went at the Tantine. Now, it is because you don't know personally those people that you feel comfortable as a Christian to defraud them of the money as long as you get your money back and the interest, the, the, that interest is not your interest, it's the money that you collected. So it shows that uh, we are still thieves, even when we are pastors, because you know that the pansy is a thief. That's why they put the, the leaders of those pansy in prison. So it shows us even the pastors, the values are bankrupt. Bankrupt. And that's why many pastors don't call me. I say, if you call me for your pansy scheme, don't ever call me again. Because they don't have any other thing to tell me except those are fraudulent kind of businesses. They don't call me anymore. They just call me for marriages and funerals. And that's or when they are fighting with the wives, who we'll stop. We have nothing in common. Two can't work together except they be agreed. So Paul is telling us, brethren, join in following, the, following my example and know those who are walking so as you have as, as a pattern. It is because it is not your brother that you should not care about what is going to happen to him. So in, in the case as well, those who are defrauding also, the NHS defrauding the system, how can you take a council house, put a tenant in it while you have your own house, subletting the house of the council? You are a thief. God does not condone stealing from the government or stealing from an individual. And many other things that we do, we lie that we are not married so that we can, uh, they can give us a house. The husband has a house, the wife has a house, the husband buys a house as a first time buyer, and uh, the wife buys also as a house. You are cheating the system, you are thieves. We are not walking in the same uh, walk. So, Paul said no to those who so walk, and the government is cracking down. Some people, like even in London, they've been put, put in five years imprisonment for running the, the, that kind of scheme. They defrauded the government because you are a thief. What are your values? What is your work? A uh, brother from uh, Bethel Church, allegedly a prophet, came from all the way from the US in 2018. And uh, he saw us online on Facebook. He saw what we posted. They said, the Lord also told him there's a revival. I said, no, I'm, the, I'm not moved by your prophecy. I hear from the Lord myself. So as he walked everywhere, so he came to London as well. And said, the Lord said he should come to, to Glasgow. So he entered the train and came to Glasgow. And while, so he called me. So I went for uh, with, uh, with him in a coffee shop. We sat there. And I said to him, how did you come? He said, no, the Holy Spirit told me to enter the train. So I entered the train, the virgin train. And as I was in the train, I would see the, the controller, uh, the inspector, when I was inspecting the tickets, I would dodge him, I would hide in the toilets. They will come out. So all the, the Lord helped me to hide and seek. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I arrived. I said, well, you are a thief. God doesn't condone stealing from virgin, then stealing from an individual. Stealing is stealing. You are stealing. You are a thief. We don't have the same Holy Spirit. My Holy Spirit will never tell you to steal from uh, the, the government or steal from uh, the, um, the tr train uh, company. So he said that his spiritual father is someone, gave him the name. So I discovered it was also a friend of my, my friend, Ken Trench in Barhead. So I called my friends, okay, what shall we do for this guy? I said to him, you should know, you cannot continue to embarrass the name of Jesus like that. Do you have a place to stay? He said, I don't have. So I gave him some money, put him in a hotel. I said, okay, yeah, for, for two days. I said, stay there for two days, and then I'm going to pay your flight back to America. Go back to Bethel Church. But that's not missionary work. Stealing from uh, the government, that's not uh, from the Lord. 
So I talked with my friend Ken and I said, okay, I have 400. I will give him 400 if you can put a hundred pounds so that we have, we buy him a one way ticket back to America. So when I looked for him, he ran away. So he found another sucker that they can steal money from, another pastor. So I said, praise the Lord, but what you are doing is not the Holy Spirit. I remember when I used to come from Manchester to Glasgow, I was coming every weekend. So the bus driver knew me. Many times he would no longer even control my ticket because every month, every weekend without fail, I was there. So when he sees me, just enter because he knew that I had my ticket. And one day I did not have my ticket. I did not have the money for the ticket. So I went by faith. I went, I went to the bus station. And when I arrived at the bus station, <clears throat> The boss pulled in, the, the, the driver that I used, like, oh, sorry, I'm late, for half an hour late, so please enter. Even when I was supposed to take the, the other bus, but when that driver came, he was always driving the weekend, he would see me, because he knows that I'm always going to say, okay, you don't need to wait for the other one, enter my boss. So he said to me, enter, and I knew I did not have a ticket. I cannot be able to stealing from National Express or Mega Boss. And I could have, the devil said to the God has answered your prayer, jump into the train, into the bus. No, you don't have a ticket. You are a thief. So I said to him, no, I would wait for the next one. He said, no, I said, no just enter the lights as we do you uh, usually. I said, no, because I, ha I have a friend of mine. I lied to him. But I was hoping my friend Jesus would be in another bus. I would get the money, even at the 2 a.m. to board the bus. So I said, I'm waiting for the other one. And then the other, so he drove off. I said, okay, that's fine. We'll see you next weekend. So at 2 a.m., the other boss came. And then the money still, I checked my bank account on the phone. The money still had not to come. I said, Father, I want to thank you. Because you don't condone stealing from a corporation or stealing from an individual. It is the same thing. So since you did not provide the money, I'm going to go back home. So the other second boss came. It was also another driver that I knew. Well, come in. I said, no, sorry. Uh, I have to do something, but I'll go in the morning, early in the morning. He says, okay, no problem. Bye-bye. See you next week. And he drove off. So I walked back home and I texted the church. Something just happened. I can't come to church this weekend. Can you just hold the service yourself? The word of God is the same for everyone. Satan will try to give you things. But the Bible calls it theft. What kind of Christian work are we doing? What do we stand for? You know, when you espouse the values of the Bible, it is easy for you to make decisions. People that are struggling with decision making is because they don't have any value, and especially not the values of the kingdom. When you think that you can join a Ponzi scheme and uh, you are praying, you, you, you didn't have the audacity to pray that the Ponzi scheme will not crash until you have uh, taken your, your, your share of the money and then it can crash behind you. You don't have the values of the kingdom because uh, whatever you want people to do to you, do also to others. If it were your company, will you want people to come and steal from your company? If you had a transport company, would you want people to come and steal the, the, the company is going to go bankrupt? You have us as a partner for a pattern. Follow our partner says. So verse 18, for many walk of whom, hey, I told you already, for many walk of whom I have told you often, not just once, often I've told you about the, the work of other not just some of them, many are walking differently. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now I'm telling you even weeping. So it's something that breaks the heart of a true Christian that have espoused the values of the kingdom. I'm telling you even weeping that they are actually the enemies of the cross of Christ. Christ did not die so that we can live anyhow. They are actually the enemies of the cross of Christ. By the way, that was the only time 
of all the five years that I came from Manchester to Glasgow, that I did not have uh, the boss fair. God just wanted to see if uh, when I'm tempted by Satan and so on and so forth, if I'm going to break and try to manipulate his word. But after that, the money for the train always came, or for the boss always came. It was done unto me according to my faith. And as I learned to trust God more and more, God was now providing. And I would pray. And that's when I learned to pray. I would pray, now God, I'm going to Glasgow. I don't have uh, the bus fare or the train fare. And today I don't want to go by bus. I'm tired of uh, eight hours uh, journey back and forth. I want to go by train today. And I wanted to be in the guest house. So I will call the guest house. Hello? Book me for two days. I'm coming. Do you have money? I don't have any money. I said, my father, you sent me. Why would I worry? And then as I'm praying, the Lord said, I switch off my phone when I pray. So said, at 1 a.m., 1 p.m., switch on your phone because someone is going to call. So at 12.55, I switch on my phone. I'm waiting for the phone call. Grr, grr, grr. I pick up, hello? I pick up, hello? So, yes, brother Jerry. I'm just outside of your house. I know that you don't like people to come to your house. If they are single women, I say, the Lord told, told you to come. I'm coming out. So I went out. And then she had a red envelope. Hallelujah. With all the money for the, the train fare or the hotel. I said, thank you. I already had taken my bath, uh, packed my suitcase, ready to travel. Hallelujah. Even last week, to note, the beginning, the beginning of August, I was worried about something, one bill. <laughs> and, I, and as I was praying, the Lord showed me someone. Uh, and the Lord, I have not talked to that person for a while. The Lord showed me someone. You see that person? We don't need to worry about the money. They are going to send the, the money, and then you are going to pay for that bill that is coming for the, 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 the voice of healing. So, that's fine. So, and I said, Father, thank you. Hallelujah. But still, my heart was not <laughs> at peace. And then I said, God, God, may God help my unbelief. God help my unbelief. But 6 a.m. when I woke up, I said, no, God. You see, I trust you. Okay, good. But let me, I'll borrow you some money, God, and then you're going to repay me. So I took my money and I transferred the 600 and then I paid that bill <laughs> at 8 a.m. Then at 12 a.m., pow, the money from that person that God spoke came into the account. And then God said to Jerry, you, do, you still don't trust me. And I said, God, yes, I trust you. And I said, God, can I just transfer my money? But God said, no, you, you put it in the box. It is already mine. I said, oh, my God, come on. I learned my lesson again. So you, you now have a sweet relationship with God. When Truly when Elisha used to say, I see in the bedroom, God, you see the Bible is now so real to me, you know. <laughs> I see, I see, I see. So many times I come to God and uh, I say, God, what are you saying about this? Should I put my hand in it or should I not put my hand in it? I say, put your hand in it. But I don't have the money. He said, don't worry. Don't. And for, as far as the voice of healing is concerned, God said, don't even talk to me about the money again. It is established. So one way or the other, I will keep on sending the money to pay for the voice of healing. And in Jesus' name, so shall it be. So you are going to have a walk of faith with God where you don't have to steal any money from uh, or any train ticket from a virgin uh, uh, train or transpennine train. You're going to pay for that ticket. You're going to pay for that hotel accommodation. God is going to supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. In every aspect of life, verse 19, Paul now says, hey, so, Sorry, whose end is the end of the destruction and whose God is actually the belly. They're only concerned about what goes into the stomach and whose glory is actually the shame. They are putting God to shame 
and activated our own shame. Now, we set the mind on only earthly things. The mind is only on earthly things, personal gain, what they can gain for from the gospel, what they can extract from people. Because they had a temporary vision of the gospel. But we, because we believe that our home is not here. We are just ambassadors. We are not immigrants here. We are ambassadors. So our interests are the interests of the kingdom that sent us because we are ambassadors. If we were immigrants, we are just fending for ourselves. For our citizenship, my brethren, is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious, uh, may be conformed to his glorious body according to the according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. And so shall it be in the name of Jesus. So, that's it, uh, Brother Paul telling us uh, about uh, our life uh, in Christ and how he's so eager for all of us to serve God like he served him, to take him as an example. My praise in the house of prayer for all nations. We are going to walk in the same footsteps of Brother Paul. We are going to be examples to our family members, to our children, to everyone that comes in the house of prayer for all nations. They are going to be able to look up to us, and we are going to be able to look up to Jesus. And at the end, we disappear to point all of them to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for today. Thank you for allowing us to finish chapter 11, chapter 3 of uh, Philippians. Paul challenged us and challenged our faith. I pray that we are going to challenge ourselves. And to the degree that we've already attained, I pray that we are going to continue to walk in the same uh, step. As many of us have renewed our mind, we have this mind of Christ. I pray that uh, we are going to be consistent in our Christian walk. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I love you.